hi everybody. Um, welcome. I'm very, very happy to introduce 50% of team today. Uh, Meredith uh, Miller, an old friend and colleague from Princeton, we studied together and um, a friend that feels like an old friend, but um, Ellie Abrams. Um, so um, along with uh, Adam Fuhr and Tom Moran, uh, they, um, they have assembled team and they've participated in very important architectural events, including the Venice Biennial, uh, particularly uh, the US Pavilion in 2016, the Chicago Biennial, um, and they have built a number of really important experimental projects um, as, as a team. Uh, Meredith has studied in Princeton. Um, Ellie uh, has studied at UCLA and before that, uh, New York University. And um, I have to say that I'm very happy to host you um, in, at Cooper Union uh, tonight. I was blown away when I saw your project at the US Pavilion at the Venice Biennale. I think your work is exceptional in that it um, raises environmental uh, problems, but makes debris sensational. And uh, the kind of aesthetics of decay, uh, digestion and reconstitution that you're bringing to the forefront with your projects. Um, and the way that you are conceptualizing this process of, um, of materiality and environmental change through uh, an aesthetic experience, I think is extraordinarily important. Um, just to quote you, and you can begin from, from there, uh, because I was very interested in your Detroit reassembly plan project. Um, you say Detroit doesn't have a material problem, it's material has an image problem. Um, and I think that this is very, very important for us to see your work, um, not uh, in, in, the, in the age of extinction and climate change, not through the lens of distance and statistics and numbers um, in a series of solutions for efficacy, but through the way that we can um, perceptualize an existential environment um, and a different kind of materiality. So thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you can give us the rules of how you want us to uh, become black boxes. We will listen to you. And following <laughs> your lecture, I just wanna say that Jimmy Louder um, um, and Mircea Veladar will moderate the conversation. Uh, thanks, thank you, Jimmy, for, uh, for doing that. They're uh, my colleagues and your friends from the Cabrini. So thank you very much. Thank Great, thank you. Thank you, Lydia, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to um, the school at Cooper Union uh, and to Lydia for the invitation to be here tonight uh, and to Mauricio for helping us out. Um, we're really excited to be here. Um, this is an extraordinary time. I think uh, that's a statement we could all agree with. And we're joining you this evening from Ann Arbor, Michigan, uh, which is the traditional home and land of the Ashinaabe, Potawatomi, Fox, and Peoria people. The past six months for us, and I'm sure for many of you, have been a time of reflection and reckoning. We have a heightened awareness of our, our own precarity, the precarity of those around us uh, in our communities and across the globe, uh, and of course, of radical and unjust inequity. And when Lydia first invited us to give this lecture, we were, of course, really excited to have the opportunity to share our work with all of you. Uh, and as we began to think about how we might structure this talk, it felt um, disingenuous or in some ways inappropriate to simply kind of come here and present our work as if nothing else was going on. Yeah, I mean, I think we just, I think it's necessary to acknowledge this context, um, to acknowledge that we're speaking to you in this time of incredible crisis and that each of you are in your particular places um, and we are here in our in our separate homes um, in Ann Arbor. Um, so thank you for joining us. We're grateful knowing um, you know, that so much is going on that you're taking a moment to join us um, tonight and we hope that you're all doing okay. It was nice to see familiar faces a few minutes ago and <laughs> we'll look forward to seeing those faces again at the end of our lecture, I promise. Um, so 
what we tried to do, and as hopefully you'll see um, in a minute, we tried to design uh, a presentation that can, can acknowledge this, this context that we're in, um, and, but also kind of embrace it, embrace the fact that we're all streaming in from um, different parts of the world, uh, that we're kind of presenting our mediated selves here, and that's kind of the best that we can do. Um, and that this is the environment that we're inhabiting is um, one of um, near constant exposure to our screens. Um, so together, um, this is what we'll uh, experiment with tonight. And again, I'll just reiterate for anyone who's joining us um, a couple minutes in to just please keep your videos off because we're not exactly sure what will happen um, if there are other videos streaming in. So we wanted to start with some ideas from earlier projects that are still at play in our current work. This project, Arrange Life, was a competition entry for a house in Los Angeles. And you can see Meredith and I are here standing in front of uh, the elevation of the house. And in this project, material qualities show up in a few different ways. So for example, uh, rocks show up as profile. So you can see here the edge of this exterior wall, uh, image printed on the facade and form. Uh, next slide. This separation between image and form is something that we've been working uh, on really since the beginning of our practice. And the origins of this are in hybrid forms of representation that arose when we needed to merge one-to-one -one material prototypes. You can see some of those floating around us here with speculative design projects. And so photogrammetry um, is just one example of a tool that we often used to digitally process material tests and produce separate files for image, which would give us a texture map, and 3D form, which would give us the mesh model. Next. Uh, so here's the roof plan for this project. Um, and you can see how the image of rock kind of shapes and profiles of rock and actual rocks merge to enclose a series of inhabitable spaces that accommodate living. Next. Another ongoing interest of teams is um, the scenographic, which for us is really about placing images in space, images that you can inhabit, um, kind of like we are right now. This can be seen in the billboard quality of the facade of, of this house behind us, um, which is meant to kind of resonate with the Hollywood sign, a kind of uh, flat sign that is just beyond the site. Um, in this project, which is called A Living Picture, this is from 2017, we're imaging borrowed sonography. So we recreated as a digital model um, a historic outdoor theater. And then we used that digital model to create images that, that we then placed in space by kind of constructing that rendering um, as three-dimensional physical objects that people could move through and around and inhabit. Next. So here we are in the interior of that same house, the house with the kind of billboard-like um, exterior that uh, kind of mimicked the, the texture and materiality and, and form of rock in different ways. So on the inside of that house, you can kind of see the, the structure that sets up that um, scenographic backdrop to the outside. Um, on the interior, architectural surfaces are also understood to be a kind of backdrop for, for life. Uh, we're trying to kind of set a scene um, that has the possibility to change and accommodate different activities. Next, please. So this is the plan where we can again see um, the interior organization of the house. Um, I think what's important to point out here is that instead of rooms, we were really thinking about um, a kind of loose staging of domestic activities. So instead of a kind of fixed relationship between um, a space that has a specific designation for a program, uh, we started of placing a range of objects, um, furniture, uh, surfaces, which you can see um, a little bit in the plan, um, and of course the kind of backdrops. Um, that set the stage for, for life. Next, please. So an example of that is here on the outside. Um, behind us, you can see 
um, what could be thought of as, as a kitchen, but maybe a better way to think of it is a kind of loose accumulation of the objects and tools that you would use um, for cooking. Um, so this is one way in which there are different modes of inhabitation and living that can kind of unfold um, over time. Next. So this project is called Additional Address uh, from 2018. And here we're continuing to think about domestic interiors. So this project is for um, is a design for an ADU, an accessory dwelling unit. So a much more modest scale of living space than the previous one. Next. And so here we spatialized images to increase the sense of scale. So as I mentioned, it's a quite modest space and we use images to kind of extend, expand that space and address the close quarters of the primary residents on the site. And we were once again, kind of thinking about an active sonography that would reveal its construction. So um, in this isometric study, you can see how the house unfolds around this kind of vertical totem in the middle, which is a, is a storage space below um, and a closet or another kind of storage space above, uh, and with exposed substructure and layered construction. Next. And here in another isometric study, you can see how we use image to pull the landscape into the interior, producing an artificial horizon that extends the space and makes it feel bigger than it is. Next, please. So in this project, the idea of materializing images uh, began to merge for us with an interest in cheap building materials. And we started kind of around the office calling this the Menards theory. So Menards is a local Midwestern based um, big box hardware store where you can find like a myriad of products printed with the image of building materials, often rock or stone, um, but also other kinds of materials. And for us, there was this uh, kind of latent aesthetic project in these commercial building products and, you know, a, a kind of humor, but also um, like an earnestness in the way which they were kind of trying hard to look like something else, but you know, not that hard. Um, next, please. So the previous scene uh, that we were just in was a design for an ADU, um, an um, accessory dwelling unit that started out as a kind of speculative project. Um, and here we're standing in the, the built version of that project that kind of evolved as it became um, more real. Um, so the reality of construction, of course, introduces new design considerations, but we really wanted to continue this dual interest in affordable construction and the possibility that that can produce um, images, that there's a kind of image of materiality that becomes the image of the project. Next, please. So given that the ADU shares a site with an existing house, and because of the local zoning code, um, it actually had to be physically attached to the existing residence. Um, so this means that the massing has to negotiate this necessity of connection and kind of sharing an address, um, while also producing a separate identity um, and a kind of face for that unit. So you can see um, right here beside me, um, there's an entrance along the kind of side of, um, of the house, um, and there's large windows that are kind of oriented to the back, which is a nice wooded area, and there's a way in which the massing kind of scoots its way to the rear of the site and leaves um, the existing site, or the existing residence has um, views and access to the woods in their backyard as well. Next. So here is the ADU under construction. And I think what we wanted to point out is that, um, of course, this is a site specific um, project, but for us, it's also been a prototype uh, with which we can kind of experiment with affordable construction. Um, here we're using uh, SIPs. Uh, this is one factory based method of construction that we're using to kind of shorten the amount of um, on site uh, labor. Uh, next slide. And here you can see um, another strategy that we're using to kind of minimize the time for on-site work, uh, which is an insulated slab on grade foundation. <clears throat> 
And what this does is it minimizes the amount of excavation. There's not a need for what's called a Michigan basement, which is um, what's typically used around here. Um, and it reduces the waste as well of traditional formwork. Next. On the outside of the ADU, there are a series of material planes that wrap volumes and slip over and past one another. There are three types of cladding. So there's a metal roof, which wraps down and kind of folds around um, the, the kind of capping the volumes. Uh, the sips themselves are coated in a liquid applied vapor barrier and then wrapped primarily or partially in a stainless steel metal mesh or um, when not the metal mesh and open joint panel. And in terms of image, uh, the focus for us shifted away from images of nature that we had been working with in previous projects. So images of rocks or plants to images of building materials like OSB or concrete. So when possible, we use the construction system to produce the finished surface on the interior um, and then use kind of image of that material to produce um, surfaces and other portions of the project. So, for example, you can see Meredith standing on the concrete floor, which, because it's a slab on grade, produces the finished surface. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we can see how in the interior, the texture of OSB and um, the very similar texture of LSL columns and joints show up on the interior to produce walls, ceilings, um, and the stair uh, to, the, to the second floor bedroom mezzanine. Um, and so the project is currently under construction, as Meredith pointed out. So some of these surfaces will get covered up, but uh, many of them will, will remain exposed. Next, please. So this thinking about um, ways to make construction more affordable is something that um, can have impact at a much larger scale than, than a single ADU. Um, especially when it comes to uh, the desire to kind of diversify uh, housing options um, and making well-designed homes that are more attainable to more people. Um, this is something that we've been thinking about in a current project that is um, very much a work in, in progress, uh, but we wanted to share at least a few images from that um, for you. Um, this is a current project in, in Detroit. Uh, and in this project, we're working systematically to produce a number of um, multifamily types that range from as small as a duplex to as large as around 16 um, units um, and in different buildings that are on um, different sites in, in the same neighborhood. And all of them are deriving from the same logics of the construction systems that we've selected to, again, try to bring down um, costs, um, which are very high in Detroit right now, um, but at the same time deliver a good, um, a good home for people. So some of the systems that we're using are the same insulated um, Sablon grade foundation, like the one that I'm standing on right now. Um, we're using a different prefabricated composite panel wall and roof system, and we'll kind of explain why um, this opens up all kinds of opportunities for the design. Um, and similar to the ADU that we're standing in right now, there's this idea that um, we can use building systems that can double as the finish. So rather than layering on additional material that adds additional cost, um, can we aestheticize the, um, the materials that we're using to kind of create um, the building and to you know, create these um, the exterior walls? Next. So as Meredith pointed out, um, the prefabricated wall and roof panel that we're using uh, is both an affordable construction system, but also opened up um, some other kind of design opportunities for the project. So uh, because it's so affordable and it's also incredibly well insulated, we can create more exterior surface area than, would typic than you would typically find in low budget construction. And what that means is that we're able to kind of break down the massing from being one block to being a series of smaller um, masses and produce an exterior circulation for the project. So you get uh, kind of smaller footprint loft units on the second story up above, which are stacked on top of larger footprint garden units. And the circulation, um, uh, which produces a kind of elevated circulation and outdoor patio for all of the loft units. And um, it's 
you know, maybe not in, wasn't intentionally designed into the project, but turns out to be like a very pandemic friendly building because there's no um, shared uh, surfaces that you have to touch in order to get to your unit. There are no doorknobs um, or um, interior hallways. So um, the there was this kind of convergence, let's say, of a desire for affordability with also a desire for sustainability and the production of a nice place to live. So things like ventilation and daylighting um, contribute to all of those ambitions. And also the buildings are electrified, so there's no fully electrified, so there's no natural gas coming to these. Um, and so something like that keeps um, oper operation costs uh, and um, uh, utility bills low for tenants, but also helps meet some of the sustainability goals for the project. Next, please. And so that this project that we're talking about, it's, um, you know, again, a, a work in progress. And I think the way that we've been um, thinking about uh, affordability um, in this case is that the idea is not to reduce architecture to a, a, a minimum product of housing, um, but really about finding these trade-offs and these kinds of opportunities and the systems that we're using um, to sort of redistribute the budget so that we can place value where it matters for um, a better quality of living. And so it's been a kind of interesting conversation um, within our office and with the larger team about where those priorities um, can, where those priorities lie. Next. And so you can kind of see a little bit of um, what I mean in this exterior rendering where we're standing outside of one of the larger uh, buildings. Um, I believe this is a 16 unit building where there's open space on the ground that connects to an elevated um, kind of shared patio space above. So again, that ability to create more exterior walls than you might normally in a kind of um, budget conscious project um, and that sort of creates a connection between the ground floor and the upper units um, and kind of creates that sense of um, community. Next. Here we are on that second level so up those stairs and in what we're calling the um, the elevated street. Um, so there are the rest of the entrances that are not on the ground floor all kind of converge on um, the street. Uh, there's a couple units that are on the third floor, um, but their doors are also um, here and they have a little a stoop before kind of um, going up to their individual units. Next. So these buildings that we've been working on um, are kind of prototype buildings for a larger development that will incorporate the different types that we were showing. So everything from a duplex um, currently up to uh, 16 unit and mixed use buildings. And one of the ambitions of the project is to work kind of higher density uh, into single family neighborhoods. And in a dispersed city like Detroit that really was designed and evolved around the automobile, creating this density requires pushing back on current zoning restrictions or um, kind of finding ways to work around them because those zoning restrictions overwhelmingly privilege single family housing. So things like minimum lot sizes, which are really big, or minimum parking requirements, which are too stringent, or setbacks, which are too large. So those, you know, things like that, which are, um, say, counter to the ambition of producing like a dense, walkable, urban neighborhood. And so a lot of this project for us has been about figuring out how to work around um, those current zoning restrictions. So what Ellie is describing suggests to us um, that there's a need for new housing types and, you know, this is a, a project that many people are, are working on um, and something that we're really excited to be um, working on um, with, with this larger team. Um, you may have heard this term missing middle. Uh, this has emerged as a kind of approach to deal with some of those restrictions that Ellie mentioned uh, in order to insert uh, a denser, uh, denser housing into single family zoned areas. So missing middle is meant to be this kind of middle between 
uh, the scale of the single family house um, and the scale of a, of a high rise apartment building. Uh, this probably isn't an issue in Manhattan, um, where many of you are, um, but in a lot of the country, um, zoning has been um, a huge hurdle. I think something like 75% of residential land is zoned for single family detached housing. Um, so there's a, a kind of history here too um, of, of municipalities using zoning um, to limit access to housing. And so um, there are a lot of issues that are layered here. Uh, so the missing middle for us is a kind of model. It's one way to try to reverse um, this trend. Um, but I think for us, there's some aesthetic limitations to a lot of the projects that come out of that thinking. Um, they're often um, attempting to kind of simulate the traditional look of single family housings and to kind of hide and fit into that context. Um, I think we're excited about the possibility of looking forward um, and, and thinking about new types that can incorporate a range of um, units and, and you know, provide housing at below market rate rents. Next. So in a much more speculative way, um, a, a kind of older project, I think this is from 2017, um, it's called Ghost Box. Um, it's also trying to reimagine um, a building type that has been very persistent in the way it's shaped uh, the American landscape. So we're standing outside of a, a big box um, that in a speculative way, team um, imagined a kind of re-inhabitation uh, with different programs through a process of, of reassembly. Um, so again, we're dealing with a type that has kind of become obsolescent under changing economic circumstances. Next, please. Uh, so the, the big box retail store um, is very familiar um, to all of us, and it is this kind of um, spatial format that comes out of a certain model of, of business. Um, but for us, there's also a really interesting material specificity to its construction and that that's something we wanted to kind of um, draw from um, in this proposal. Uh, so here uh, we're selectively disassembling the existing um, big box store and then reassembling the parts to um, kind of break down um, what it's currently kind of designed to do efficiently and to create the possibility of other kinds of occupations. Next. This project, uh, which is called Detroit Reassembly Plant from 2016-2017, took on a really large factory building in Detroit, the Packard Automobile Plant, which was a building of reinforced concrete and brick. So similar to the big box, a building type that represents um, a kind of failing typology which remains embedded in the city as a ruin. And so the project proposed redistributing uh, the physical matter to create alternate uses and a new image of that disused materiality. So we were trying to shift from uh, ruin to, or kind of perceived ruin, uh, and the liability, let's say, which comes along with that perception of blight to an active site of collecting, sorting waste material, and casting new material out of that waste. Next, please. Uh, and this project, Ghost Box, that Meredith was describing, was an homage, or an homage, sorry, to site, um, and, and some of their projects from the 1970s and 80s. So this project was commissioned for the 2017 Chicago Biennial, and uh, was our um, kind of re response to a provocation that asked us about a contemporary relationship to history. Uh, and so of course we're appropriating sites uh, signage here with our practice name. And it's of course a little bit cheeky, but it also the project in general was a real test for design ideas that we're continuing to work on um, and that we're currently starting to explore uh, in a new project. Next, please. So for this project, which is uh, also in Detroit, we were asked to renovate an old commercial space. So it's this building that you can see um, behind Meredith and me uh, for new retail and a community-based 
organization and nonprofit. So this is the way that the building looks today. The one important piece of it that's missing is a, bill, a large billboard, which used to be uh, mounted above it and was removed by the advertising company that owned it. And the building is currently um, not used. It's um, disused and is facade has become a kind of canvas for art. Next, please. So in our proposal, rather than rebuild the roof, which is caving in, um, rather than rebuilding the interiors exactly as they were before, uh, we're proposing to insert a new building uh, into the shell of an old building. Uh, so we're kind of shifting the interior a little bit to the right and in, in this elevation in front of you um, in order to kind of open up space on, on the left. And so there is this very explicit uh, distinction between the old and the new, which in a way helps kind of reframe or represent the qualities of the existing building that, that are nice, um, such as the brick detailing and uh, these big framed openings, which we kind of mimic in the new building. Next. Uh, so here you can also see one of the results of that move of inserting a new building within the shell of the old building by kind of pushing it over to the side. Uh, we're opening up this courtyard space, um, which has uh, several functions that can kind of um, overlap. Next slide. And here you can start to see how the design is progressing, uh, where there are these overlapping um, activities that are centered here in the courtyard from basketball to eating food that comes from the walk-up food service that's behind and under the billboard, which is now a kind of, you know, reinstalled as this um, occupiable space that comes off of the second story of the, of the retail and nonprofit behind it. Next slide. So the idea here uh, is that, you know, subtraction can yield new possibilities for the building, which, um, so we're comparing this maybe idea to the, to the uh, open air civic space that was produced in the ghost box, ghost box project previously. Um, and thinking about ways that we can carry forward those ideas into this new project. Next, please. So we're now back in the ghost box model, but we're now on the other side of the model, which reveals the interior. So to inhabit the inside of a retail building, which was designed for a certain model of efficiency, we inserted scenographic elements that help recode and reframe what's left behind after the partial disassembly. So you can see uh, behind us these large wall scale um, scenographic backdrops printed with image of ground and sky. Uh, or on this side, also um, walls printed with images which kind of evoke mountainous or rock-like rock, rock -like qualities, um, but are actually large-scale photographs of uh, physical material tests that we did in the office. So the printed imagery hanging establishes a new horizon that extends and kind of reconfigures the space of the interior. And the profiled walls, which have this kind of mountainous type quality, create visual layers that break down the interior to, into smaller scales. Next. And please, go, Meredith? I'm right here. <laughs> hey. In place of efficiency, um, we're trying to introduce some variation and change. Um, so again, there's this layering from, from many points of view within the project, um, both, both high and low. Um, and the kind of layering of these uh, scenographic elements um, do not produce a kind of single vantage point or a single, um, you know, possibility for the kinds of um, activities that can happen there, but it's really meant to be somewhat open-ended, that the layers can kind of change out um, over, over time and that new scenes could, could, take, uh, could take shape. Um, so this idea of reassembly that's really been a kind of ongoing um, sort of strategy that our practice has been experimenting with um, is, is tied to uh, the visual in, in that sense. Uh, next, please. Oh, thanks. Um, but reassembly is also tied to our interest in material reuse. Um, so 
here you see some kind of early prototypes that came from the Detroit reassembly plant um, design um, process where we were literally recombining fragments of brick, fragments of concrete with waste plastic and um, mixing them up in a way that were still kind of rough, um, that still retained uh, the identity of, of those materials and kind of produced interesting textures and color combinations that while they were identifiable and could be kind of connected to um, their previous use uh, as, as building materials, as um, plastic containers, um, they also started to kind of produce a new image. Um, and that, that that's something that reassembly has also um, meant for us. Next slide. So in a, in a more a full scale prototype, uh, called Plastic Order, which is um, this column um, over here. Uh, we again combined waste plastics with uh, building materials, so concrete, brick, glass, some of these things that are pictured up here. Um, in this case, we were really explicitly interested in the physical byproducts of demolition and construction, and that these could be uh, reconstituted and recombined um, in this case, in this monolithically cast column. Next. And I think at a different scale, the models that we have built um, kind of operate as small constructions. They become sites for material experimentation, you know, again, at scale. Um, so uh, we're able to test a little bit an idea about tectonics. What does it mean to repurpose um, the smallest fragment of something to a large chunk of, of a building. Um, but also it allows us to test the aesthetics of um, this, this reassembly um, process. Next. So this project is called Models on View. It's an exhibition that we designed for the gallery at the architecture school at Kent State in Ohio in 2019. And our original plan when we were asked to um, do an exhibition for this gallery was to display some of our recent models. So the ghost box model that we were just in, the model for Detroit reassembly plant. Um, and as we were working on the project, we found out that the door, which is right here behind me, um, is narrower than the model's smallest dimension. So there was no way to get them into the gallery. And so uh, we needed a new plan. <laughs> so uh, next. Uh, so what we did was we built a series of large scale dioramas of our project to create scenes, which were intended to be viewed from outside the gallery. So they were staged in various ways. Some of them appeared like quote unquote models in uh, crates or the image of crates. Um, some appeared as images um, on monitors. Of course, they were just backlit pieces of vellum. Um, and some were these dioramic uh, scenographic models. Next, please. And I think an important part of this exhibition was that instead of maintaining this illusion, um, because we, we didn't allow anyone to have physical access to the gallery, but we chose to reveal visually the apparatus behind the image making. So you can see here in these images, the way in which uh, the soft box lights and the props, which are holding up blankets printed with images from our physical model uh, were revealed uh, as you got close to the gallery window and peeked inside. And for us, this, uh, let's say kind of ethos or value of uh, eschewing some kind of perfect view uh, in preference for our multiple views um, is something that is really important to us. And we were interested in this almost kind of perverse mediation of our own work through representing images and representing materials that had themselves originally already been representations and images of materials uh, in their first instantiation. Next, please. Yeah, so. We, we thought that this would be a good place to end, that this exhibition kind of represented a way in which um, we can kind of pull back the curtain 
um, and peel back the many layers of, of imagery, the multiple streams of information that um, create our impressions of reality. So beyond the specifics of, of this exhibition um, right here, um, it suggests a kind of way of seeing, and it's a way of seeing that we think is of utmost importance right now uh, where we find ourselves. Ooh, the media experiment's going wrong. <laughs> you have to switch off your virtual backgrounds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Doing it now. That's amazing. But now, Ishan, all I see are the videos of the people speaking. I don't see us in the video anymore. Yeah, that's okay. We can switch to this. Okay, go ahead, Mayor. Oh, well, I mean, that's the kind of, uh, this is the end of our slideshow, but just to kind of um, maybe pull forward some of the themes that we were discussing. Here we are. Um, so we wanted to kind of step into uh, this virtual space, but also kind of step out of it to continue to peel back uh, those layers that we were speaking of, the layers of mediation that we've all been um, almost kind of forced to inhabit these past weeks. Um, how many of us have burnt out on Zoom at this point? Um, but behind these layers of self-presentation, uh, I think, um, what we find is that it's not all pretty um, for all of us. It's been an emotional and logistical struggle. And that's something that, again, we just wanted to kind of acknowledge and um, allow that to be known. I think we were, um, it was important to, to both of us not to sort of present in a way that um, emphasizes a kind of virtuosic production <laughs> in spite of all this, but instead um, kind of acknowledges this, this context. And um, just to leave you with, um, the impression that we're we're all in this um, kind of space together. Um, we're all going through a lot. And so I think um, peeling back the layers, um, and maybe we can sort of uh, step out of the, the frame for a minute. Um, I think what's also behind, in addition to um, maybe those kinds of um, you know, hardships and crises that we're finding from, I think what you also find behind the layers are all of the forms of support that we all rely on and that we just want to kind of offer an appreciation for right now, whether that's financial or institutional or personal. Um, I think that, um, you know, all, all of this that you've seen here and um, being able to produce this tonight is um, a product of those kinds of um, networks of support that we all uh, there. Ishan, will you um, swipe the, the background? So um, we have many people that we want to thank uh, for tonight. So I think first we wanted to make sure to acknowledge Tom and Adam, uh, the T and the A in team, and um, all of our past and present employees and collaborators and research assistants. Um, and then very important this evening, we wanna thank uh, Ishan Paul. So he's our kind of media DJ um, behind the scenes that made the format possible. And um, he's been working really hard uh, this year with Taubman College on new modes of digital learning. And we're really thankful for him uh, helping us out tonight. So we hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, we look forward to continuing the conversation.
I think if people want to turn their videos on, we would love to see your faces again. <laughs> Hello. So hey guys, so that was an amazing lecture. Thank you so much for that. Um, I mean, Lydia, do you want to say anything uh, before we get started? Of course, I'm grilling. Um, no, I, I was just blown away, to be honest. Uh, you know, when when you guys were presenting, it took me about five minutes to realize that it's real time and it's not pre-recorded. Um, so I think it's an amazing format. Uh, um, and, and as you say, it does, it does reflect all the layers and the hardships and the forms of support. So, um, I, I mean, I would love to talk to you on another event about how you're doing, how you're doing it, but uh, I'll leave it up to Jimmy and Mercia to moderate the questions. But uh, thank you so much for doing this for, for tonight. Uh, I have to say it's extraordinarily original and I haven't seen anything like that. So it's a first. We're very lucky that, uh, that you tried this experiment at the Cooper Union. So Jimmy um, and Mercia, take it, take it on. Well, I think um, for due to technological, for some reason my video is actually not allowed to be turned on <laughs> by the host, uh, but that was such an inspiring uh, lecture and, and I really appreciate the innovative framework behind it. Um, and I was curious if you could talk a little bit about how you also discovered the, um, I would argue, the, the collaging of time and the collaging of the, the materiality. Um, hello. It's something that creates these really unexpected moments uh, before you start the physical construction, after the physical construction occurs. And I wonder in which areas of your projects you discovered something really unexpected because uh, what I found to be really inspiring is this idea of the technological, the digital image and the, the actual image and how they actually blur the boundaries between the two. And I wonder if you could speak briefly about, you know, what happens two years from now or three years from now in terms of this kind of blurring of time through these so-called layers that you spoke about so eloquently. Um, th thanks for that question. It actually made me think almost like a couple of questions <laughs> either behind or ahead of that. So I feel like I'm not going to answer the exact question as, as you asked it. Uh, but it made me think that the beginning of those kinds of experimentations is really the Detroit Reassembly Plant. That was the first project we did together. And it's a project in which we were developing our working methods. Um, for that design, but also as a collaboration. Um, we'd all collaborated in kind of different ways and um, kind of uh, across the years, but this was the first time that we kind of um, had formalized it. And so I think there was a discovery in that process of the ways in which our different, you know, our kind of individual working methods, what we could sort of borrow from each other and what sort of hybridized to be a way to respond to a site that would just was overwhelming to us, frankly. None of us were really used to working at that scale. And so I think what was comfortable to each of us was to kind of um, approach that, that building, this um, massive um, vacant automobile factory, to approach it just as a kind of physical artifact. And that where we could start was with what was there and the tools that we had were physical and digital. And that a way to begin that that process was to um, find ways to document, but then work with that documentation. And so it really evolved from there. But I think what your question about time makes me think about is that those working methods then start to become self-referential in a way, <laughs> in a way that we saw right. play in the and where the images then become more materials, and then those materials mm -hmm. become a question, which becomes a diorama, which becomes a video, which becomes a lecture. <laughs> right. So it, how, when does that become exhausted or when it, does there need to be a, an infusion of other kinds of um, inputs or, or methodologies? And I think we're at this um, kind of transition moment now that we're doing, um, you know, more um, building work. Um, that we're, we're again finding ourselves looking for the appropriate methods and the appropriate ways of, of responding to these kind of new, new challenges. 
Yeah, it also makes me just think about the nature of source material, you know, mm -hmm. where things originate um, and whether whether that is something that we should value anymore. I mean, we could kind of think of everything as, um, you know, like constantly evolving from one state to another, whether that's uh, physical materiality or, or idea or, so I think for us, um, this kind of constant churning in a way between different formats and between physical and digital and material and image, um, you know, after a while, like the kind of orig where the thing originates, like doesn't hold a kind of special status, mm -hmm. right? There's no um, like authentic original anymore, I think, which is, yeah, I think an important thing that we kind of hold on to in the work. No, I really appreciate it because the entire process of how your practice works seems to be really embedded in this idea of um, use but also challenging the, the origin right like where you're constantly finding another way to use it or misuse it your through your research i really also enjoyed the anti-finish game <laughs> and from a tectonic point of view i was uh intrigued if you could also talk a little bit more about just your perception of of this kind of blurring of not just time but also scale because of what i found to be really inspirational is is how these materialities from a tectonic level are also changing their origins, so to speak, into something very novel and unexpected, uh, where they become these very surreal uh, images of the future or what your intentions were, but they also transcend scale in ways that we do not expect and we do not anticipate from the original intended use of how traditionally we would normally try to um, domesticate materiality. Uh, so I also wonder if you can uh, perhaps highlight some of your most exciting materials or how you, um, like which ones were the most exciting to kind of absolve them of their original purpose, so to speak, in terms of their um, uh, potential. You're gonna leave that one for me there? I'm waiting for you to jump in with the Menards theory again. <laughs> you can take a crack at the Menards theory. Well, I, mean, I guess uh, part of that is that there, there's the off the shelf and then there's the like more crafted. Um, and maybe this, this is what you're getting at with the kind of differences in scale, um, that the off the shelf becomes defamiliarized in the way that it gets applied or combined uh, with other elements. And, um, but, I, but I think that's something that we've been sort of playing with, especially moving into projects with a limited budget is that, you know, a lot of what we're doing isn't actually um, that unique to us, but that there's entire, um, you know, catalogs of material products that play this game of, um, you know, uh, dis disingenuously presenting themselves as a kind of different materiality, um, but not trying that hard to with these kind of thin veneers of printed imagery. Um, I think we're, we play with, with those kinds of um, strategies, but there's also the more, um, you know, experiments with fabrication like the casting and combining plastics and aggregates that maybe takes on a different kind of quality. Yeah, I was thinking, I think like the question of scale and material has really, it's an interesting one. And I think it's one that's kind of undergoing transformation for us as we move from more speculative work into built work, because mm -hmm. in the large scale models, like in the ghost box model, um, it was really important for us to, to have a kind of realism to the model so that the moments when we deviated from that could be apparent. Like we needed that to kind of contrast with. Whereas, um, and I think, and as Meredith said, like we took very seriously um, the like construction technology or way in which that, that kind of original big box store had been constructed as we were thinking about um, disassembling and reassembling its parts. I think working now on, you know, projects which are being built or or will be built, then there's like a tension between, um, maybe between the tectonics or or say the way in which something is built and what it looks like. Mm 
Uh, and so if, if like tectonics is the expression of the structure or the expression of the way in which parts come together, then it's a, it's a challenge now for us to think about, um, like the emphasis isn't so much on being faithful to that so that we can start to contrast with it as it was in the model, but it's more about an opportunity to kind of play with it, I guess. So like exposed, the exposed fasteners for us, for instance, um, like in the ADU, we have a lot of exposed kind of hardware and, and you know, um, joist hangers and things like that. It's not so much because we're interested in expressing the tectonic, but because we're interested in affordable construction. And so the more that we can kind of strip away finishes, the more we can achieve that. So then the challenge is to aestheticize that, um, that construction. And then I think for us, what we, you know, really hope to do in the end is kind of elevate that one step further and have moments where you might see um, the kind of image of material or the image of construction in a way that is becomes kind of scenographic as opposed to simply um, functional. Well, I guess that was my, I mean, that was my, one of my questions and maybe takeaways is that, uh, again, like I know, thanks, thank you for the presentation. I think I had I don't know if you've seen you guys lecture before, so that was nice to, to see. Uh, and but it looks like one of, the, one of the projects you guys are working on is really how does one make image itself a material, right? Like somehow like the, you're saying that the image is, is, is its own uh, material and it's sort of a, um, and I think in doing so, it, I think it asks two questions. One is A, what does that then mean for tectonics, right? Does that mean that now you have a totally different idea about what it what material is, since it's privileging uh, the image so much. Does that free you from a conventional idea about what tectonics is, or does it uh, force you down to now reinvent uh, that can be totally divorced, or something that's a total reinvention of a tectonic system based on this new idea about what material is? And I think then the other part, because I think that's interesting about that is that then another thing that this thing that what you guys are working on does is, as, as a, is by going from the image to the material to the tectonic, it basically allows you to skip, I think, an important step, which is basically geometry, right? Like none of the work seems to be really predicated upon the geometric organization of material drawing, right? There's no, not, a, not a lot of lines in the stuff that you do, right? So like if the line is the disciplining mechanism by which we construct, uh, we structure, and discipline matter to then take that and then basically develop a sort of unit from which you can and then you introduce tectonics. Geometry is a sort of mediating agent because it's scaleless, it can do all the stuff. And so by working with from the image, making the image material, all of a sudden somehow geometry is no longer playing that function. Um, so yeah, I don't know if I'm, if I'm be a question there, but I think it's more like my observation. Um, so what do you think? Well, so <laughs> I, I have a thought, but first, um, Ishan is telling me that if your camera is disabled and you're trying to turn it on, put it in the chat and he can kind of individually enable your camera. Mm -hmm. Okay, technical side note. Um, do you think, I'm gonna, I'm gonna answer your question with an annoying question Be because I think it's, I think, I don't know if it's so true anymore, but I would say at the beginning of our practice, we very much intentionally avoided the line as a, as a, the line was an indication of abstraction, right? And we were working with like dirty real materials, right? Um, and then we were taking those dirty materials and scanning them and putting them into the computer. And for us, that materiality was as kind of real as the physical materiality. So even the digital material was not an abstraction for us. And the, so I guess the question is, um, you know, do you think the way in which you describe the relationship between the lo organization line and geometry holds in an era like this one where um, things kind of originate in often in a digital format? I mean, maybe, I mean, I think that's, I think now the question has become like, yeah, like, is, you know, the line no longer has the primacy it once had, right? So I think now, the question, yeah, then now there's much, many more different and especially with photogrammetry and everything else that's beginning to happen in the scanning, there's beginning to be uh, a different system of geometry, of organization of points, put it that way. Mm -hmm. and that points no longer are um, sublimated into linear organizations, but now getting lost in the mosaic again, 
right? So like the, the sort of the birth of the line as we know it in representation and drawing and painting, uh, if anyone's read the Panofsky, right? It's basically the mosaics and the sort of the edge, the edges of the mosaic tile itself uh, began to construct lines, right? So then all of a sudden the, the notion of linear perspective comes right after that. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, no, I think I, 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 that's just one of the things I think that's the thing for me about the work is that it's looking at a different geometric paradigm and that's not predicated upon that. Um, may I ask a follow-up question? Mm. I knew that would hook in the day or <laughs> my um, First of all, thank you very much for, for the lecture and the, the precision of, of format. Um, I'm wondering uh, how you're using the term scenography, if, if it's a casual use of the term or, or is it more formal? Uh, and if it's more formal, to what degree do you hold, uh, let's say, the ethics of theater as the basis for uh, architecture? And what is the connection between scenography and architecture? And, um, and going back to uh, Jimmy's question about tectonics, which has historically had connections with scenography. It is not always about the actuality of construction, but the expression of it. And therefore there are editorial aspects about any construction that not only reveal things, but also conceal things. Where do you, uh, how do you define the ethics of, of what you do in order that one can then go back into it to read its discipline? To determine its discipline. Um, well, I, I think one thing that I wanted to kind of pick up on in Jimmy's question and in Mir's Nadir is um, the question of the tectonics of the image um, and sort of loop that into this question of sonography and the kind of discipline that it belongs to. Are we kind of um, importing ideas from theater? And so how does that give us uh, principles or frameworks to understand the effects of uh, the scenographic effects that we're producing. Um, I think at the beginning, there was um, a way in which we were looking to existing, let's say, uh, materializations of imagery, whether that be the kind of billboard effect that we were um, speaking about with uh, a range life, the house, that there are ways in which images are already placed in physical space. And there's a kind of um, tectonic that has been developed over time to support that um, kind of physical image making, let's say, um, and that that's something that we could kind of borrow from. Um, so I don't think it was strictly limited to theater, um, but um, more of an idea of looking around at um, uh, printing substrates, billboards, um, what are the kind of um, physical instantiations of, of images placed in space? Um, and that for us, there's a kind of experiential uh, understanding of, of the scenographic, that it's always about a body being kind of, or, or really a kind of perceptual um, point of view being kind of positioned in space, but it's not privileging a kind of one point perspectival um, subject, but there's a kind of multiplicity of layers that can be inhabited and moved through, but also peeled apart. So I think scenography and um, in that sense has a backside, um, that it's not something that is necessarily in the round, um, but that it's something that kind of reveals its own, its own artifice and that that's something that's um, been of interest to us. May I ask a follow-up question? Hmm. Um, so I'm interested in the, right where you left off the, the, the semiotic performance of that. Uh, in a way, you know, there were a couple of phrases that caught my attention, like redistribution of the budget. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the imagery and the materials are um, reference kind of middle class materials, you know, is not marble necessarily is more like um, 
big box store, you know, maybe not Home Depot, not Home Depot, but you know, those kinds of construction materials that are, are ne aren't necessarily the veneer, uh, but more part of the, the structural made into a veneer. Um, so it made me think of the idea of a superstructure uh, that you're dealing with the image of, of or the main ideology or the main kind of um, semiotic material uh, of, a, of an era of a time. Um, mm -hmm. And so I wonder it, how, how, how much you're working with that um, in terms of, um, you know, how it performs politically for you as, a, as part of your discipline. I mean, I think, I think the project where we've thought about material and, um, and the image of material as something that performs politically most explicitly is the Detroit reassembly plant project where, um, and we didn't show that project in depth tonight, but the, I mean, Lydia mentioned it in the introduction that we were specifically interested in the, um, say cultural association um, that images of materiality carry. And because we were being asked to work in Detroit on a site that was um, a kind of notorious site of ruin porn um, that like attracts tourists to the city to come and gawk at it. Um, it was this, you know, kind of um, site of tension around the association with that kind of material decay. Um, that both represents decline and, and um, liability, but is also something that people, um, you know, revere for a certain kind of beauty. And we, we you know, kind of work, worked really specifically to try to think about how we might represent that materiality in a way that would produce new associations and, you know, maybe extending that idea like, produce a kind of different politics around what to do with those kinds of buildings. Um, and I think that that thinking extends again into Ghost Box, which is the project where we're kind of re-inhabiting or repurposing an abandoned big box store. Um, I think it's a conversation that's still happening in the office as we're moving to thinking about uh, like missing middle housing uh, and built projects. But I think it's more, um, I think we haven't had it explicitly yet. Like I really appreciate the question because I think it's it's one that we probably, you know, I think could, should foster more explicitly in the office. But I would say that the idea of um, like, the idea of exposing construction materials as the finished surface, as a form of affordable, as a kind of, we think like exciting opportunity to merge uh, an interest in affordable construction with one of spatializing images where the building materials become the kind of image of their own materiality. Um, you know, we, we haven't kind of unpacked, I would say, I think the kind of politics of that of that um, combination. But it would just maybe go back to the kind of Menard's theory, right? That we were speaking of that you that you pointed out. So um, like in commercial building products, this kind of, this aesthetic exists uh, and it also then exists in the kind of, you know, um, in this circle of like academic architecture, right? So, you know, like, why is that? Uh, what is that about? Elizabeth, I think you're muted. Sorry, I was talking. So um, uh, maybe you should open up the questions from the audience. I'm happy. Could I pick up on the conversation? It's not a specific question, but maybe. Please. Yeah, so so thank you so much for the lecture. I thought it was incredibly um, 
poignant and potent on so many levels to, uh, for me to watch, I think how you constructed an argument uh, and then at the end um, took your own argument and filled it with doubt um, or, or, or like kind of, it, it, it was as if to say your early research on the imaging of materiality and reality and the realization of um, image and the kind of potential to slide back and forth between those things seems to me exactly the place that we are in now. So, so kind of having got the, the global manifestation of your early research, I was kind of surprised to hear you say, it's been a really tough time and that there wasn't something kind of wildly, um, that there wasn't some kind of opportunity you felt about having your laboratory be wildly expanded. Um, uh, also, I think, um, I think for me, the other question becomes is, uh, is your practice, if it were to move into really constructing housing uh, at a point where the arguments about the asceticization of an unfinished space, I, I don't know that that can really, I don't know that you can in any way expect to engage a family in Detroit to, um, to I, I think, think of that as anything but um, a, a spin, I guess. Uh, so I think also, so the politics of moving into where your audience is no longer this audience, this academic audience, but is potentially the audience of uh, families and people outside our discipline. Um, can you see that, or, or how do you think about your research and its potential to either continue to inform the practice or for it, or, or for you to really begin to have to develop a whole new the theory around what it is you're, you would like to do uh, in that next phase. But super fascinating to see you really, I think, take on the whole breadth of the potential for architecture. You want me to, are you going to jump in there? Well, no, I, I appreciate the, you know, the kind of um, insights and observations about the differences maybe between some of the aims in our earlier research and earlier design speculations and um, maybe some of the, the tensions or conflicts that arise as we're moving into this new phase of, of built work. And I would say that one of the things that we've kind of consciously cultivated as a practice is that we kind of don't work from, um, from grand theories. Um, I think we're very situational in the way that we um, take on uh, individual projects, um, that there's something that we kind of uh, learn and observe and respond to with each new site or set of circumstances. At the same time, we're the same people with the same interest and the same kind of um, culture in our practice. And so there, there are interests that kind of, you know, create these threads that run through. Um, but I think what I appreciated um, most in your comment is um, given this interest in kind of uh, mediated uh, materiality, you know, should we, <laughs> is there some opportunity that we could find in this moment and amidst all of the maybe more challenging aspects of this moment? And I think like this is one right now, um, just the working on this and presenting it to you was something that we took on as a kind of uh, it's just something fun. And we wanted to make it fun for us um, and involve people who's like Ishan, whose work we really respect and that's what we tend to do. Um, and so, yeah, we, we enjoyed it. I also wanted to say, or, or maybe just offer a clarification, which is that I think um, like the housing, the project that we're working on now where we're designing housing for Detroit, 
doesn't have the kind of raw materiality of the interior that Meredith and I were standing in of the project that's currently under construction. So in that project, like the, the kind of mate uh, construction material as finish is like um, a concrete floor, you know, so something which, I mean, which we all kind of appreciate as a nice finished surface or these um, uh, prefabricated wall panels where on the exterior, um, they already, the wall panel as is has a vapor barrier, which is inherent in the composite panel. And so the cladding can be very kind of cheap and, and minimal. So the, the actual like interior living spaces um, will be nice places to live. So, I, cause what I heard in the comment was maybe some skepticism about um, outsiders, which we very much are in Detroit. Uh, we don't live in Detroit, you know, kind of coming in and offering up this raw thing as if it's, you know, edgy and and yeah and I 100% I want to be clear that it's not our intention um, or what we're doing and so the intention for the um, Detroit project you know which is really uh, a, a collaborative project with a big team of uh, construction partner and developer and landscape architect and whatnot um, is to offer like really nice places to live um, at a minimal price if we can do it and so um, that's just wanted to clarify that in case that was seemed con confusing. Yeah. Maybe we should wrap up here. I think that was a great lecture. Um, we should stay afterwards and have a couple of drinks via, via Zoom. Uh, that's the one part we miss, even with Ishan's <laughs> magic uh, trick <laughs> of putting you inside uh, inside the landscape. That's something we will really miss doing with you. But um, thank you so much for, um, for giving us a reason to laugh um, and smile tonight with your experiment. It was amazing to see, uh, to mix all of these different mediums that recycle each other in themselves. And um, I, I think uh, it's, um, it's really amazing. Congratulations for your work and to Ishan for this incredible presentation and thank you to uh, Jimmy and Mercia for uh, moderating. And thank you everybody for your questions. So um, congratulations. Have a good night, everybody. Thank and you, everybody. Virtual drinks and big hugs. <laughs> good night. Thank you. Bye.